<clears throat> awesome. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for being here for our next chat with the city manager. Um, so I'd love to introduce Armando Villa. He is Menifee's city manager. And um, while the question and answer period will be truly just a discussion and you are welcome to ask you know, any questions you'd like to know, we also have our um, incredible executive team here who will introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, but the focus of his chat at the beginning will be on our city's outlook as we come out of the pandemic. So he'll have a brief presentation and then we will open it up to questions and discussion. Um, and just as an FYI, while this is very informal and we wanna be together and close, um, we're also streaming this on YouTube and many people will also watch after the fact. And that's why the microphones are very helpful. They won't be able to hear anything on YouTube if we don't speak into them. So when you do have a question, we'll just have a couple microphones around and if you could ask it into that that would be great so um, now I'll hand it over to Armando and then he can oh thanks my name is Dominique Samario and I'm the city of Menifee's public information officer and so it's really an honor to have you all here together and now I will hand it over to Armando and then um, our executive team so thank you all thank you Dominique like uh, Dominique mentioned uh, my name is Armando Villa city manager for the city of Menifee I've been uh, your city manager for just shy of four years. Um, uh, I've been here, have had a pleasure of working in such a evolving city, and there's a lot of good things happening in our city. So before I start uh, this presentation, uh, I wanna also thank all the, those of you that are joining us through YouTube, uh, and, and I'm hopeful that some of you will be able to participate uh, and send questions. You know, the subject of uh, today's uh, series with the city manager talks is coming out of the pandemic, but we wanna be able to open it up uh, to other items, topics that you may have uh, concerns with. And, and we have our executive team here today uh, to, to be able to answer questions generally. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves so you all know, you get to know who they are and uh, We'll start with our police chief over there. Good morning, Pat Walsh, uh, police chief. Happy to be here. Good morning. My name is Ron Puccinelli. I'm the city CIO IT director. Good morning, Gina Gonzalez. Uh, I am your economic development director for this great, big, booming city. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Kitzero. I am the community development director. I'm happy to be here. Good morning, I'm Nick Fiddler, the Public Works Director, and pleased to be here, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Nix, Community Services Director, overseeing Parks and Recreation. Quick plug, it is the last Menifee Moonlight Market this Friday. Come on down, it's Tuesday. Uh, it's 2000s night, so we're gonna have a 2000s cover band and Shrek playing at Central Park on Friday night. Thank you. And good morning, I'm Sarah Mann, wearing the city clerk. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Uh, so you're probably wondering why so many directors, right? So we're a very uh, dynamic city. Uh, for the last four years, we've grown uh, roughly about 12,000 residents. I don't know if you know that since or incorporation in 2008, uh, the city's population was about 60, 67,000 residents. Today, we're, we're probably gonna hit over 100,000 when the census comes out. So we are a, a growing city, very dynamic. Uh, and all the existing residents and the, the incoming residents are all asking for more services and more programming and, and more infrastructure. So we need a workforce that uh, is able to allow us to give the residents what they need and at the same time uh, develop strategies so that we can continue to grow the way the city uh, is, is, is growing so that we uh, mitigate some of the concerns that you all have. I think the number one uh, concern that I get uh, via email all the time is about traffic. And, and you know what are we doing about traffic? Well, you, you all know that we, over the last three years, we spent a significant amount of funds building bridges, you know, Newport Road, uh, Scott Road, and we're about to embark on a new project uh, next year, which is the Holland Road Overpass. And, and hopefully, I did hear some very, very good news from our federal government that the infrastructure package is on its way to get approved. And we have roughly about $20 million of funding 
in the infrastructure plan to be able to help us build more infrastructure, primarily Scott Road widening and Bradley Bridge. And if that is, is funded, then uh, next year we'll come back to the council with a proposal to construct uh, Bradley Bridge and solve some of the problems that we get when it rains a lot. I'm sorry? Murrieta Road is, is, is on the plan, but le let, me, let me go through our presentation. I was just I wanting to introduce, and then I really want you guys, to, uh, when, when you have a question, please allow us to give you a microphone because we did find out last time that a lot of the people that were watching on YouTube couldn't hear you. So we really appreciate if you hold your questions and, until you have a microphone in front of you. Um, so the, the, the CM uh, discussion, city manager discussions coming out of the pandemic is, again, uh, has an emphasis on the financial component of, of that, but it also has a little bit of, of some of the things that the, the city did to be able to protect our residents and protect city staff and then continue to inform the public about some of the mitigating measures that, they, that were being recommended so that we contain the spread of COVID. Uh, so that will be a presentation that will be done by our guest speakers today. Uh, Margarita Cornejo, she is our finance manager. And uh, Wendy Priest, she's our deputy uh, finance director. Did I get that right? Yes. And uh, they have been really instrumental in, in developing strategies for us and as we develop a budget uh, to be able to pay for everything that we need to pay for, but at the same time to be able to weather the impacts of COVID in, in that uh, a lot of the businesses really hunker down and shut down. And, and um, as you know, we're a city that, that is growing, but we rely on revenues from retail sales and development and property taxes. And when the economy slows down, uh, we, we're, we hurt. So uh, with that, um, you know, when, in 2000, 2020, when this was taking place, we, we had a whole bunch of uncertainty as to what this was going to mean for our financial outlook over the next coming years. And we took a very, very conservative approach to budgeting. I think we budgeted roughly about $5 million less. We cut down expenses because we just didn't know. We just didn't know what the impacts of the pandemic were going to have on our city and our ability to provide services. So we did uh, slow down and so did the rest of the world. Uh, the, the Menifee was, was not uh, immune to the impacts of uh, what it did to California, what it did to the United States, and also the world. So um, we luckily we have such an awesome team of, of directors and our finance team, so we put together some really good strategies so that we can mitigate the impacts of having less revenue coming in. We, we are a city that relies on sales tax, we rely on developer uh, fees and, and uh, for us to be able to provide all the infrastructure that I just mentioned, at the same time provide services to the community. So we put together a very aggressive strategy to be able to make sure that we messaged and we, we did things that we could to make sure that the developer community continued to work. As we hunker down and, shut and, and close our doors we didn't we didn't we didn't shut down for business we continued to work virtually and uh, luckily we were ready for you know going online and and continue to provide services online and we're going to show you some of the things uh, that we did and and by the way we were one of the few cities that was able to do that so quickly uh, I talked to a lot of city managers in other parts of Riverside County and also other parts of the state and not all the cities did as well as we did. Some of the cities didn't have an option. Some of the cities, uh, and for example, in some of the cities in Coachella Valley, a lot of those cities rely on hospitality, rely on hotels, rely on golf courses, restaurants for revenue. Well, guess what? They were shut down for a year. So a lot of those cities are really hurting right now because they just didn't have any income for a year. And uh, they, they're having to right now adjust the way they do business, adjust the way they spend money. And at the same time, they had to let go of a lot of employees. So they, guess what? They don't have employees to be able to provide 
the services of the community. So some of the cities didn't have a choice. Luckily for us, we have such an awesome team of individuals, and we quickly huddled and put together a strategy so that we can weather the impacts of of COVID. And I think what you're going to see in our presentation is that we did pretty good. We did pretty good. So with that, um, I'm going to I'm going to have our uh, Margarita uh, put uh, start with our presentation so you can. Uh, see the outlook and see some of the things that we did and also see some of the results uh, financially, uh, how we're doing and how we're going to deal with the pandemic moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Margarita. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Thank you again. My name is Margarita Cornejo. It has really been my honor and pleasure working for the city of Menifee since 2012. My introduction to local government has really been here. This was my first government job, and it just has been an amazing experience so far, growing personally and professionally in such a vibrant community like here, like Menifee is. And so it is my pleasure to spend some time with you guys this morning and anybody who may be joining us live to give you guys just a little bit of insight of how Menifee as a local community specifically kind of gathered together to deal with this once in a lifetime incident, hopefully for us um, with COVID-19 situation. So as our city manager stated, our presentation really is focused on coming out of the pandemic, but specifically coming out of the pandemic strongly and and stronger even than when we when it first came to us so statistically in any given year there's a prob a 1% probability that a influenza pandemic which is the most common or most likely pathogen to lead to a severe pandemic situation would occur it happened in 1918 and then it happened in 2020 again with a new pathogen the coronavirus so here you know there's the saying, history repeats itself, right? And it's so stark to see that in 1918, you know, 100 years ago, that society then faced the same things, dealt with things the same way, and you literally can see like a public notice from 1918 telling you they had to go through shutdowns. They were putting and promoting outreach on masking up. They were changing the way things were being done, even shopping. They didn't have internet back then, but they were transforming into shopping by phone. Um, there's a lot of outreach and community and it was the same strategies and the same kind of efforts and probably the same feelings at some point of helplessness that you feel that we've felt in this last year when you have an invisible enemy that you you know the whole world is trying to tackle on at the same time so this is really the story of Menifee and how we've dealt with it approach it so most immediate the impacts of a pandemic can be kind of summarized in three main categories the impact to the individual and the community safety, that immediate cause and impact on morbidity and mortality. Then there's also the financial uncertainty because you have this, an, unknown, an unknown that's literally affecting you know, people's lives. You don't know what it's going to do to businesses. You don't know what it's gonna to do to people personally. And then you also have an impact to the quality of life, wellness, and economic stability. And often this actually comes not even directly from the virus itself, or the pathogen, it's coming from the mitigation actions. Because as a way to kind of address the first one, that safety, the most immediate urgent thing to do, unfortunately, you have to reorganize and restructure the way you approach things. And some of those can lead to temporary and unknown um, mitigation actions like that stay at home orders that most immediately impacted our local businesses and, and larger businesses. And there's a lot to be said about the quality of life and wellness of the individual. If nothing else, you know, as humans, we are social people at different levels and some people more social than others, but we're still human. And it's that connection to each other that makes us be human. When you have something like this and you're literally asking people to separate from each other and stay isolated, it does something to people psychologically and emotionally that is hard and straining for everybody to go through. So a pandemic's impacts aren't just something that's going to literally affect your health, your your health in the sense of you physically, but also emotionally and psychologically. So as a, as a local government, specifically, what were the challenges for a local municipality like the city of Menifee? For us, it was to continue to provide municipal services without interruption, 
there's still an expectation and a responsibility for us to go out there and continue to serve our almost 100,000 population. There's also the responsibility to directly support the federal, state, county efforts to mitigate COVID-19. We literally are on in this all together as a, as a planet globally. Also to directly support the Menifee business community during these difficult economic times. And I think the main clear task that fell on the city was in the last year to put together a budget that would prepare, that would continue to support our residents, our developers, and our businesses in an, in an uncertain economy. So what was the strategy? If we could summarize it in one short sentence, it was really to navigate the uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic with a focused effort on maintaining the Menifee community safe, informed, sound, and fiscally sound, and prepared for better days. Because they will come. It seems like they're far, you know, a ways away sometimes, but they will come. So we did that with kind of three main approaches. Resilience. Addressing the urgency of the present, but preparing for the future. Specifically, what does that mean? From the financial end, from finance and our department and all the various departments here, for 2021, we planned a, a conservative fiscal budget planning and management. It included things like bringing down our budget by $5 million, and once it was adopted, really watching and monitoring all the contracts, all the expenditures, all the staffing that we were doing in a cautious, but also you know resilient way in that we didn't want to hinder and destroy the growth that was already happening in Menifee before COVID, and that actually continued to happen through COVID. But also understanding that now there was a new layer of ensuring that there was that safety element and maintaining that safety of our community and making sure that we would not put the city in a position where financially we would be facing not only COVID, but we would have financial strains that would endanger us being able to continue to provide all municipal services at the level that we have been doing for historically since the city incorporated. The second one is safety, implementing city hall safety protocols. The city immediately went into implementing social distancing, things like social distancing markers, enhanced disinfecting services, plexiglass and PPE, temperature um, screening stations, and those continued to be used throughout our facilities. And then to really speak into the investment of addressing today, but more in the future, is a strategic effort to invest in technology infrastructure and solutions. The city really put a focus on having our zero stop shop solution up and running for all our development counter services, as well as our virtual city hall with virtual appointments and online um, application processing. And for our staffing, the city invested on purpose to make sure that we had updated and mobile computer hardware and equipment. Because emergencies will come, they may not come in pandemics, they might come in the form of a fire or an earthquake, but at this point and after going through this experience, we can you know, confidently say our staff is prepared to literally be, be mobile. If there's a fire today at City Hall, our staff has the equipment to be able to move off site temporarily, wherever that may be, and continue to provide services. The second part of our strategy was engagement. And our engagement really was a multi-dimensional community outreach and support focused on keeping the Menifee community safe, informed, and supported. So in the two columns on the right, we have the efforts that were specifically focused on the businesses, which were ones that were really, really most immediately impacted in a financial way. There's a Menifee Forward, Menifee Cares, Menifee Bingo. And then to the other side, we have that that really concentrated outreach and education um, component for our community. There was Mask Up Menifee. We have a um, residential rental assistance program to help those that have been impacted personally um, from you know, employment going down or decreasing during the pandemic. And then there was a concentrated effort on reaching some of that population that is a big population and an important population to Menifee, like our senior populations 
which has specifically been a higher risk one. Um, the city immediately went into action and put together like a senior senior resources webpage with comprehensive information for our senior population in this time to know that you know where could they go for any kind of assistance or support that they may need. Of the original almost $1.2 million that the city received in 2020 for CARES money, we really wanted to highlight at least $450,000 specifically went back and directly to our businesses and in outreach efforts. And the last component of our strategy our strategy was kindness, preserving the human connection through enduring difficult times. And I think that one matters the most, especially, you know, in a situation where there's fear and uncertainty in an individual basis, and we're all facing something we've never seen before. That's what makes a community like Menifee special. We focus, we care about that kindness. And how did we do that? Um, well, like with a new police department, we ensured community connection throughout the year, celebrating those special moments with our residents, be it a drive like celebration, drive through celebration with our police department. Our community services department implemented 24 virtual recurring programs and activities and had seven drive through special events. In addition to that, they also have continued to facilitate and continue to this day facilitate our monthly senior meal distribution program that distributes about 7,000 meals a month. So for our economic outlook, we have a sun with a cloud because in reality, you know, that, that is how our prospect is. We knew, we knew coming into 2020 when something so large was going to come in that there would be economic impacts coming to us. But we've seen, and we hope we've seen, the most intense part of it, and our outlook looks sunny. There's still clouds there, and they will slowly go away, but all our financial indicators point to us in the direction that our finances look strong, stronger than they were a year ago, and growing. So in conclusion, pandemics, Unfortunately, they do not disappear as suddenly as they appear. More often than not, they slowly fade and they will leave long-term impacts. But the city of Menifee, we can say we stand stronger than we did a year ago because we did it together and we're here together. And while the situation is still evolving and it really is from day to day, we feel that our strategy that came to play a year ago and that we continue to implement is going to get us to continue to not only survive through this pandemic, but actually thrive and come out stronger. To the um, side is our chart that shows our main general fund revenues. And as you can see, our revenues have grown in the 21-22 budgeted year with and incorporating the fact that we had the uh, impact of COVID in there. So that concludes my present presentation. I thank you guys very much um, for your time again, and we're available for any questions. Uh, thank you, Margarita. That's an awesome presentation and a nice story. I think I think uh, when we, uh, a year ago, when we started to meet and start to brainstorm about what are some of the things that we could do to, to weather the uncertainty, uh, we did have an expectation that we were going to be talking about this a year from now, and I'm so glad that, that you know those numbers are very reflective of the successful strategy that that we put together for our community. Uh, you know um, those charts; they're, they're they're not very good for other cities. I've talked to other city managers that they are going to continue to struggle for the next two to three years to be able to ramp up their their revenue and operations. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, how can that be? Uh, we we really rely on sales tax and and um, developer contribution fees as they develop. But we are focusing on trying to develop our commercial base. And I think our economic development department spent a great deal of time uh, continuing to make sure that our commercial developers had an access to our to our city hall for permitting because we you know, we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't just shut down and, and not have them continue to build. Uh, that would have been devastating. It causes a tremendous amount of, of an impact on their end because when things are not moving, banks take away funding for them. So as you can see, if you drive around town, there's still a lot of builders that are building commercial buildings and bringing some of those needed 
and desired uh, commercial uh, restaurants and things like that that the community wants. And um, we didn't see, you know, with the exception of two projects that we are still working uh, with, uh, most of the 200 plus projects that we have are extremely successful. Uh, but uh, we know that the community cares very much about those two businesses that are that have just not been able to recover uh, from the COVID impacts. And we, we can talk about those two later on. So th that is pretty much the, the presentation. And like I said, uh, your questions may not be related to the pandemic or the financial outlook. You may have questions about other things in our community that we might be able to address with you today. We have our executive team here. And uh, with that, um, we'll open it up for questions. And I know that we did get some questions online, but I want to uh, give you the opportunity first, since you made the effort to come here today, to ask those questions that you may have. Good morning. Uh, my name's Cliff Lands, and uh, I've been a resident of Menifee Sun City for about six years now. It's, it's a nice community, and I, I moved in because uh, as a senior, you know, I didn't want a bunch of rowdy, thing, you know, music and this, that, and the other. But uh, to get to the point, uh, they're working on Murrieta Road, EMWD, and I guess it's going to be several more months before they complete the, the, the lines for the desalinization, and we're running that to their other plant. But the sidewalk there, I wish, I wish they would address that. Uh, even though Don Sharp went out after I called and sent pictures of the overhang trees and the holes in the uh, walk area, but there's, there's never been a sidewalk there, but at least have it safe enough so you could walk uh, on the dirt area there. And this is after you go past the creek across from Pete Peterson Park. Uh, I've taken pictures, but it's it's really unsafe. And they they went back, and, and as I indicated, and and they kind of level it out. But it's it, there's still unsafe areas. And Don said that they couldn't do something because of the footing or the wall there, the retaining walls for the residents. But it, they're just just so uneven, and uh, and I, and I hope that they address that. And the other issue is kind of related. And maybe uh, we're getting more and more people using the. Uh, uh, the bike pass, and I love it because I just got my new e-bike. But uh, because it's hot, most a lot of people are going down, uh, going on it when it's, the sun is going down. Maybe they can put some reflectors and maybe solar lights or something. I know it, the budget's limited, and also on the turnarounds, and I, we, I can show pictures on that. Maybe put slow down or stop. I think somebody already went through a barricade. They had to fix that because there's a lot of winding areas. But uh, and also encouraging people that are on it to uh, get lights and reflectors because the sun the sun's going to be going down sooner and sooner and people are going to still be out there five six seven o'clock without lights on their bikes so reflectors on the road and i already cleaned up one area somebody let dirt come down and and so maybe they could periodically the city can go through and clean the bike area so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I, the other issue, I don't want to take up too much more of the time, is it's sad that whether it's uh, Apollo Loco or, which I don't need a lot at, Jack in the Box and McDonald's, they're not having enough people to work inside, so they're closing down all these facilities. So everything is now drive-through, so you can't get out of the heat and relax. In, in these in these you know these food places amenities like I said just the other day a Polo Loco closed inside Jack, uh, Jack in the Box in Sun City sometimes I ride there with my bike closed inside anyway that's all I'm going to say you folks have a blessed day and thank God nobody's here wearing a mask because they're useless just like the governor Ooh. except this one <laughs> thank you uh, so um, we do have a plan for Murrieta Road. Um, I don't know, Nick, if you want to take the opportunity now, or I, I, I can answer some of those questions because I think I have a history with that. Okay, so, so let, let me address some of that. So, so we've known about this issue for some time, but um, we do have a project funding in place, ready to go to upgrade Murrieta Road from the creek all the way down to Newport Road. But uh, the water company, e, uh, VMWD, EMWD notified us that they wanted to put that pipe under the ground so we didn't want to go out and improve it only for them to come back and dig a hole and then leave a trench there so we halted our project and, and are waiting for them to complete their project and when they're done we've got to come back and redo the street and one of the areas that, that our engineering department is looking at is addressing that area it's, it's, it's really a sidewalk issue but it's also a drainage issue the, the holes in the ground and the, 
the, the stuff that you see there is because every time it rains, water drains through there and it causes erosion and it gets into the creek. So that, that is a little more robust solution that we need to develop. And, and I'm pretty sure that our engineering department is, has a plan for that. Yes, thank you, Armando. Um, you had mentioned you'd worked with Don Sharp in regards to the, the cleanup along uh, Marietta. I was involved with that request as well. And actually, our streets division, um, through Alan Young, went out there and uh, trimmed the trees, graded out the best we could. We do have plans, as indicated, uh, Armando has indicated, uh, to go in there and do more work. The, the issue being that there's the current construction zone that's immediately adjacent to it doesn't allow us to get larger pieces of equipment and materials to fill in those holes uh, safely. Um, so we, we, we tried to make it the best we could for the time being until we can come in there and correct those larger drainage issues, as Armando has indicated. We're actually working with EMWD as part of that because they'll have excess materials left over from their project, and they're they're going to bring those materials uh, over to the site that we can use to compact and, and place into those uh, ruts that are created from the drainage. So it is on our, our radar. Um, we do, we, we're, unfortunately, we're kind of constrained right now because of the current construction conditions, but we went out there and did the best that we could uh, to make it safe and passable and removed a lot of the vegetation so that um, it wouldn't be a hindrance to the people that are walking back and forth through the construction zone. Th thank you, Nick. And then the, the second half of your question, um, I, I think it's probably two or three responses to that is the, the trail, the, you're talking about the, the, bicycle. The, the bicycle trail. Awesome facility, we love it, but it's not a city facility yet. <laughs> and, and I say yet because there is an effort uh, to try to get the county uh, to dedicate the, the, that facility to the city. And, and we're going through the process, the, the assessment, the financial assessment, the financial impact of taking that facility over. Their desire is to give it to us, right, uh, Jonathan? However, it is a county facility. It is a, it is a multi-city trail. This, this trail is going to go from where it starts all the way down to Hemet through the, through, the, through the wash. So eventually when the county builds it completely, You'll be able to ride your bike from Menifee all the way to Hemet if you desire. And right now, they completed this first phase. In fact, they were at they were at the Parks and Trails Commission last week, uh, and they sort of laid it out. Uh, there, there. Not only is this portion um, a concern to them, and and you know we'd like to be able to to um, be able to help them out because our residents use it. So why not, right? But there's a process that needs to take place before we can commit to more, and we do realize that that lighting is necessary. And and you know I, I think Jonathan, it's safe to say that we're we're actually exploring the the option of, of installing solar solar lighting that that and we've done it in other parks, right? And it's not as expensive as your traditional wire, hard wire lighting. So we're we're gonna look into some of that stuff and and hopefully. At some time in the future, we can come back and implement that uh, as the budget allows us to do. Uh, Armando, I also noted um, uh, Mr. Land's um, concerns about the turns. So uh, as he mentioned, uh, he mentioned we did have the parks director from the county here last week. I have to reach out to her anyways um, regarding that um, possible transition plan. So I'll mention those concerns to her. Yeah, and you can comment there. I'd like to hear as well. You bet. Thank you for those questions. Very, very good questions. With the exception of that political note at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any, no? No any more questions? I can. You want to ask? Uh, well, the uh, the third uh, comment that I, which doesn't personally pertain, well, it does pertain, personally pertain to me and everybody. I mean, is these these f eateries that are closed because they don't have a sufficient amount of staff and when it's hot out, I mean, does everyone really like going through a drive through and then going home and eating it? The whole aspect of going to going out and eat is to go out and eat and relax. So whether it's El Polo Loco, every other time I go there, they're closed. Or as I indicated, the Jack in the Box in Sun City or McDonald's. Uh, you know, what is happening where either, either uh, they're, just, they're closing down the dining rooms or they don't have enough employees to work? 
What is the city doing to help? Let's promote I, I could take that. Jobs. I could take that. So we are continuously trying to promote jobs, but you've hit the nail on the head with COVID. A lot of corporations, because of the lack of employees, early retirements, care responsibilities, I mean, it's multi-pronged or faceted, this issue. But a lot of corporations have decided to shut down their internal dining and have been strictly relying on drive through as their, as their means to survive, um, especially right now with the additional um, federal unemployment pandemic payment that is out there. About 13 million people are still currently on it. And 26 states have decided to end the, um, the benefit early. California is one that has not, it is set to expire September 6th. Um, so until then, uh, yes, employment is going to be a very big issue. We've continuously have held um, uh, job fairs um, locally. We've partnered up with uh, other communities, the, uh, the county. So we're continuously pushing that. We've created a jobs webpage to help promote and share the job opportunities in our area and the surrounding areas. And we've also done outreach with our local businesses that are um, hurting for employees to share that information with us so we can connect with the colleges. We can connect with other, um, other communities to share that so that way we can try and garner uh, the workforce that's out there but unfortunately um, I do think that it's um, as most economists have alluded to it has directly to deal with that uh, that benefit payment right now correct <laughs> again so I wanted to I wanted to uh, is do we have any questions yeah we have a list of questions oh but actually mr. Crawford do you want to hand him that microphone Wendy and Imelda can turn that on. Right. Oh man, he's doubled and a up. pastor with two mics. This I is a good it. day. Not that you need a mic. Uh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Let's get some pizzas. Um, no, my name is Casey Crawford. I'm a pastor here in Menifee uh, with Elevation Church. We celebrated 10 years and love being in Menifee. Love the job that you guys are all doing. Um, I've been in the Valley since 1989, before it was Menifee. Um, and so I have, I have a question in, um, in, I, in more like more, want to open a conversation that would hope to continue. And it has to do with the uh, the social impact of pandemics and coming as a pastor and and seeing the 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 social well-being psychological spiritual well-being mental health seemingly being a, uh, a just a accepted collateral damage uh, from from most governmental agencies during the pandemic appreciate very much that that was addressed in in your presentation that that Menifee is aware of those things and so I, I think maybe to try to get to a question um, quickly would be <clears throat> if such lockdowns occur again, which, you know, like you said, we're in, a, we're in an age where new things are happening all the time and I'm, I'm not convinced that we're not gonna go through another round of lockdowns. And so um, I guess my question would be, is, is there a way that we can have more robust discussions about the social impact of the pandemic and the lockdowns and what bold solutions, bold meaning potentially going against some of the regulations if needed, but what bold solutions um, could we look at uh, in order to, uh, as, a, as a city, consider the long-term um, mental health and psychological you know, effects of you know, said lockdowns? Um, I, I read an article, I think it was yesterday, in the newspaper just about uh, the mental health of teens in Orange County, and they said uh, uh, among teen girls specifically, uh, suicide attempts doubled uh, during the lockdown, and, and actually the number of successful suicides uh, was five times greater in teens than the number of teen deaths of COVID in Orange County. And th th that was just a shocking stat to read. Uh, and and it's, it just speaks to the bigger picture of the mental health. I know the CDC put out a report early in the lockdowns uh, last year uh, that 40% of adults in the US uh, self-declared that they were going through a mental health crisis. And one in four young adults from the ages 18 to 24 had suicidal ideations. 
And that was like way early. And so, you know, you fast forward another six to nine months of all of these social uh, moorings and, and, and relationships being removed from them. And, you know, the, the science shows that Zoom does not cut it <laughs> for human engagement. Uh, it does not replace um, in-person in social engagement. And so um, I, I'm, I'm honestly just more asking a question of or just maybe opening it up to how as we probably face uh, the or we do face the uncertainty of potential lockdowns again can we be thinking about that ahead of time and what kind of conversations are we we having I mean, I as a pastor it's breaking my heart that those realities are there I was in I had a conversation with a 15 year old young man yesterday a friend of my son and he was talking about you know uh, wearing a mask indoors at school they went back to school and he's like oh I'm, I'm fine with it I'm fine with it I don't want to die from a virus and it, it was it was just so quick and it, it's just like I mean I understand that, and, we, and I'm not negating the reality of the virus and the deaths and those kind of things. I mean, but from a science statistical standpoint, that young man has almost 0% chance of dying from the virus. But it's, it's the world that he lives in now, especially with this new Delta variant that they say is less deadly, early returns, to say it's like a common flu. But I, so I'm concerned about our kids and you know the complete removal of youth sports, even outdoors, and the interactions. And so again, I'm I'm really trying to just come with an honest, you know, compassionate pastoral question of of can we begin planning now for the next one, and what kind of bold steps can we be taking as a city to say, especially for our kids who don't transmit and don't suffer, you know, the the mortality like the the older generations. What can we do to, to care about them enough to think about their long-term mental health and ways that we can keep them interacting healthily? I, I'll be honest with you, that's an excellent question. You got me thinking. You got me thinking. I, I don't know that our city has the service infrastructure to be able to support that, but it is a reality. It is a reality that, that uh, it, it almost... Um, becomes kind of like a non unintended consequences of the things that we're doing, right? So we all think that that um, and by the way, I, I think I think um, I'm not making a statement or anything, but I think that the next wave, when it comes and it, and we're starting to see it, uh, we'll, we'll, we will we will be more prepared to deal with with the the mitigation. Uh, the the when I when I think about you know, the mitigation that was implemented when the first round, there was a, a great deal of uncertainty. There was a, a great deal of unknowns, and, and the science was behind it. I think a year after that, I think we know a heck of a lot more about this thing, and we know and we tested the mitigation. So I foresee uh, when, when and if the second wave comes in that, that we're going we're gonna to be less likely to jump into harsh mitigation than before. So that's what I foresee. But, but again, a lot, a lot of this issue has become politicized and has become uh, divisive. So, you know, again, back to my, my statement that we don't have the, the infrastructure and, and our service infrastructure to be able to say we're going to deal with that directly because a lot of it is, you know, has been structured to support a growing city. But I, I do not discount the, the ability for our community services department to partner with our face organizations to develop a summit that talks about this, right? I mean, that, wouldn't that be a great thing to do? That would be incredible. I would okay. love to be a part of that and spread the word. <laughs> okay. So excellent question. I think we're going we're gonna to start thinking about it. Um, and and as, we, as we deal with, with the future, because I, I think you've all seen, you know, a lot of discussion we starting to see numbers rise, um, and and uh, there's a lot more hesitation this time around from the federal agencies and the state agencies to implement something so quick. They're waiting to see how everybody reacts. So we so that can only means that we're we're we learn from the past. Sure. So yeah. so I, I I think that that. Um, starting to think about some kind of a summit that talks about that with our groups uh, will help develop some kind of understanding for our, our city council and our executive team, team to, to know. Armando, if I may add, um, 
Casey, good morning. Um, that might be a good topic. You know, I know we're going to have, you're the chair of the Interfaith Council. We have an Interfaith Council meeting, um, I think in September, right? First Tuesday, coming back right after Labor Day. So maybe we put that on the agenda to, to talk about um, forming some kind of summit, gathering resources. I know you and, and a lot of the um, Interfaith members and our community service, our community partners members have always attempted to share as many resources as possible, especially anything that involves free counseling, you know, suicide prevention. Um, could we do more? Absolutely. And, but I think we could do more together working together on that stuff awesome thank you sir sounds great great are there any oh yes absolutely i'm sorry i don't want to be monopolizing this whole thing but i wanted to add on to first of all uh it's a fact the cdc whatever whoever, whoever puts out the publications about who's affected the most by this I like to call it a scamdemic, or primarily people over 50, actually it should be over 60, with promorbidity, pre-existing health issues, obesity. Obesity is the number one issue. Kids are not affected. Under the age of 21, I think there was like 300 out of 330 million. They shouldn't be forced to wear masks at school. That's the bottom line. Everybody should push back on this mask thing because hypercapnia, uh, it, it just psychological effect of wearing a mask, it, 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 it's, it's not healthy for the kids. It's, to me, it's demonic. The city and everybody who needs to push back, kids should not be forced to wear those face diapers. And, and in fact, nobody should wear them, but definitely the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from this group? And then I can dive into the ones we received online. Okay, okay awesome. So one of the questions, and this might go to Nick, but they were wondering if there will be fixes to Bradley Road. It seems like the blacktop is tearing up from the traffic. Will they be doing anything about this? Unfortunately, I'm not sh sure what section of Bradley Road they're referring to, but we can actually drive the roadway and um, review it for any type of repairs necessary. He thinks maybe near the creek might be an area you might want to start looking at. So. Uh, okay, definitely. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will look into that area. And, and please be aware also at Salt Creek, we do have a project to construct the bridge over the Salt Creek Channel, so um, that is coming in the near future. That's great, okay. thank you so much, Nick. Um, another question is, you know, Nick, popular guy, you might have some <laughs> input on this one. Um, this person was wondering if a bike path is possible down Han Road, something that would connect to our current bike walking path, I think that's the Paloma Wash Trail they're probably referring to, and run south past Holland all the way to Scott would be great. They live in a community down there, and they would love to have that type of connectivity. And they said, thanks for all you do. Thank you for the question. Uh, the city does have an active transportation plan. The plan does include a uh, Class 1 multi-use path f on Han Road from Newport all the way down to Wickard, which is about a quarter of a mile, half a mile short of Scott Road. And then it does transition to a class two bike lane, which is on uh, uh, bike lanes on uh, on the roadway. So as del development does occur along uh, Han, the, this class one bike path will be constructed. Um, and we are always looking for additional funds through ATP, which is a program that does allow us to build um, bike lane improvements. However, I do uh, also encourage comments to be made. The, the city does have a interactive map that's on our city's website. If you uh, plug in active transportation program, um, you, you will find an interactive map where you can place comments just like this that we can focus on and start to target what the community needs are. And then also that helps us apply for federal and state funding for those areas, because as we get those requests, we can include that as part of our uh, grant applications. That's great. Thank you so much. And that interactive map is really incredible. We shared about it a couple weeks ago and um, received a lot of great feedback from the community. So thank you for that. Um, this one might be for Mr. Jonathan Nix. They love our parks, so that's great. But they're also wondering if there might be a chance to get some parks with water features. They feel we have a lot of sports parks, but would love water features. Absolutely. That's something we're working on. As um, all of you probably know, there's a lot of new housing 
um, going in as new housing goes in. Um, they also are required to build parks. So we're actually talking to a couple of developers right now about uh, possibly building a community pool and also a splash pad. So I can't say who yet because we haven't settled all the details on that, but that is something we're actively looking at and working on. Great. Thank you. Um, this one I'm guessing is going to be uh, maybe Armando and Gina. Armando, uh, you touched on this at the beginning, but can you share an update on the theater? That was someone's question. Man, I'm going to pass that to Gina. Uh, Gina, I can't find you over there let anymore. Me, let, what happened? Let, me, let me kick it off. Okay, so, so I mentioned that out of the 200, 300 plus projects that we have, and they are successful, we have two projects that have failed. And, and it's not that we, the city, are doing it. It's, it's a private developer that had trouble with their bank or their contractor. In, in the case of the theater, I think it, it, the, the impact is more directed to the impacts of COVID. Okay, so, so in this particular case, you gotta understand that Hollywood wasn't producing movies and nobody was allowed to go to a theater. So, so, so that directly impacted this developer's ability to get a, to, to finish the project because he wasn't gonna finish the project and had no, no material to show and no one to go see it. So automatically that became a problem with the banks. So that's what uh, we continue to, to, to hear from, from the, the owner that he's having challenges, but things are getting better. And I think, I think Gina, you have an update on, on your latest discussion with the owner about it. Uh, thank you, yes. And to your point, Armando, um, during COVID, commercial funding was almost gone, dust pated, nowhere to be found, especially if you were um, some type of hospitality or entertainment use. Um, it started, obviously, it hit them on the East Coast a lot quicker than it did by the time that California caught up with the pandemic it rolled out. They were already impacted on the East Coast before we were impacted on the West Coast. Um, but with that, uh, the banks have been monitoring the situation. Um, throughout the pandemic and there are lawsuits that are flying back and forth between cable companies and the movie business believe it or not um, people are showing stuff on the cable channels when movies are rolling out they haven't even had a movie that has been played in the theater solo yet mind you so that is something that the, believe it or not banks do have input on those types of of things um, when it comes to commercial lending uh, it's a lot different than when we talk about with residential loans right when we're talking about project construction so they do it in phases and so that's what ended up happening to george kerkorian on his particular project when the banks ended up pulling out it's very different than residential loans but he's been working on this throughout the pandemic all of his tenants have um, released over and over again during the pandemic they're committed um, he's actually received um, a few he's got a couple different phases but he's received additional um, tenants believe it or not sit down restaurants and stuff like that um, so he's very excited about moving forward he's getting good news from the banks that things were uh, progressively getting better for him so he's hoping to be able to have, share some good news in the coming weeks with the, the community um, so we're very encouraged by what he's been talking about so um, that's the latest he's been monitoring what's been happening um, overall in the movie business so I think that you know their very first showing is end of October November is when they're gonna actually have a stand standalone feature, so the banks are actually watching that as well. Great. Thank you both so much for that. I have just two more that were submitted virtually, but I did want to check in. Did any questions here? Okay, because you guys are so great. So two more. This is a quick one. Um, they were wondering, um, so the, the city of Menifee was very dedicated to public information. Again, non-judgmental, but just putting it out there about the cases of COVID-19 within the county and then specific to the city of Menifee. And so uh, all the way until June 15th, when things opened up, we did um, daily case counts. Um, and this person is asking will we be continuing to post um, or will we again post um, so I'll leave that to Armando and okay. yeah so so we're we're monitoring what the county's putting out I think the county continues to to uh, document the cases um, you know we felt that you know coming out of the pandemic it would be and the, the numbers started to look really good, so there was no need to, to panic anymore, and the community was well informed, so we stopped doing it. But 
it, we're, we're going to have to balance the, that need versus versus um, uh, the other needs. Uh, uh, so we'll monitor it. Great. Thank you so much. And then the last question was um, more of one for Armando and was related to the whole chat with the city manager. And they were just saying, you know, they'd love, they appreciated the opportunity to get to know, you know, you as a manager more through these events and just wondering kind of what's your vision for the future for, from like a city organization perspective. So that's a nice way well, that's a to loaded end. Question. I saved that one for the end. So <laughs> anyways, so thank you. So we only have how, how many hours? And you have four minutes. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. You know the, the the city manager chats series was was envisioned as an evolving concept, right? We at the beginning we did we did see the need to inform the community about uh, infrastructure because that was probably the number one email that I would get every day. What about traffic? What about traffic? And we did I think a good uh, job explaining to the community that a traffic problem is not necessarily because that we're causing it. It's we're in the middle of a of an area that that is fastly evolving. So we're, everybody wants to go through our city, more specifically Newport Road. So I think we, we, we did a good job explaining to the community that we were aware of the issue and then we had a good plan and a good fiscal plan to be able to address future needs. Uh, and I hope that the community understood that so that they could at least be at ease with, with uh, how we're dealing with that. And then uh, the, the, as we started to think about what other topics is the community interested in, with, you, you're going to let us know. You're going to let us know. Email us about what is it that is, is uh, causing a concern in the community so we can address it and have an open discussion about it. Um, really, uh, we, we haven't rolled out what the next series of topics are going to be, but I, I, hope, I hope that you help me with that so that we can uh, give you answers. I really don't want this to be in, to be uh, something that you say I'm just going to have a direct chat with the city manager. That's why the entire the entire executive team is here. I, I don't do this alone. They help me, and then along with our 200 plus employees to provide the service that we need. So, you know, my my outlook on on the city is I you know we we want to be one of the most innovative cities in the country. And, and, I, and I say that uh, not as an aspiration, but as a, something that we can achieve. And I think Ron, our IT director, and most of our executive team get tired of hear uh, me say this when you know, we need to find innovation in everything that we do in, in our city. I really would like to see us move from the conventional bureaucratic way of doing business in a city and start doing things uh, more innovative with the use of technology and innovation. You know, we live in, in the three-click, uh, I, I call it the three-click uh, era. You can buy a car with your phone in a matter of three clicks, okay? And yet in government, we continue to have a, a bureaucracy of paperwork that takes forever to do things. So I want to be able to change the mentality of how we deal with providing public services using innovation and technology to help us. I see, you know, I, 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 every time I drive through Newport, my phone tells me I need coffee from Starbucks. Why is that? Because they found a way to get to my phone, right? So, so I don't want it to, to, to be, to be that, that bad. But I think the private sector is moving so fast to try to capture uh, your attention, and we're not in government. So I want us to, to, I'm really intrigued in finding out what is it that we need to do to get to that thinking. You know, I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what the community's thinking so that we can go give it to you. But, you know, having to, to write an email or write a letter, that is antiquated. I really want to know what you're going to be looking for over the next two years so that we can do it. And have you say, oh, look, we're... Uh, Facebook, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to, <laughs> and for those of you that use Facebook, when you're talking to your husband or wife about something, and all of a sudden, two minutes later, you get a pop-up. Say, hey, look, you need this. Not that to that extent, but I really would like to create a, a government that is more responsive and more immediate responsive to your needs. So that's kind of the future, and I think we're working really hard to develop a smart city initiative. We just went to council and the council approved for us to be able to start the, the pathway to get there. 
we are doing several pieces, several elements of that um, smart city concept that would eventually be rolled out, right? We need to start with uh, making sure that everybody has access to bandwidth, right? And our, our, our IT director is working on that with our, with our rest of the other uh, public works. So over, over the next five, three, five, ten years, we're going to be pushing what that is going to look like and how do we become a smarter city so that we uh, can address your issues much faster, right? And I know that we have an app. We have, if you haven't downloaded the app, you know, um, and we made it so interactive so that if you see a pothole, you can say, I, there's a pothole here, send it, and then that app is going to pick up the, the coordinates and it's going to tell us where it is. That's the beginning, but I know that there's more. So that's kind of the vision that I have is to develop a, 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 an innovation concept that addresses your needs much faster than, than uh, traditionally. So does that kind of answer the question? Yes, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it's 9.32, so that was also pretty good. But if that led to any discussion, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? That'd be great. Here, let's give you the microphone. Hi, my name is Dennis Minadio. I've lived here in Menifee since 2005. Um, I just want to expound on what Pastor Casey said about uh, the lockdowns uh, that could possibly be coming up. And I noticed that when, I forgot your name. Margarita. Margarita, when you were talking about uh, some of the things that were on the board, it says that uh, Menifee's safe, informed, and prepared. The information that you all are getting about COVID and lockdowns and mask wearing and all that, to me, is the most important thing. So if we're getting all of our information from the mainstream media, which is trying to destroy and put us all into a dungeon, um, I have mega, mega information. I'm not going to go into it because I know that we're closing up right now. And I just need to know how and what's the best and effective way to get all that information to you all, along with many of doctors, true doctors that know the exact thing that's happening with the testing and all the stuff that has to do with COVID. It gives you the true information. And without that information, we're just in the dark because the mainstream media is not going to give it to us. So what is the best way for me to get that information to you, knowing that it will get out there? And my last question is, is everything that we're doing in this city, is it based on our constitutional rights? That's another thing that is just really hitting me hard in my heart, because we have a right. We have our constitutional rights and we're getting a lot of it taken away by people that are telling us hey we need to lock down hey we need to test this we need to do this we need to do that well do we really need to do that when the truth is we we've, we've been held a lie you know we've had a lie handed to us and i just want all of us to be informed so whatever the best way for me to get that information to you you guys look at it tell me i'm crazy or go forward with it. And thank you for your time. No, thank you. We took notes and, and I think we're going to we're going to address that. Awesome. Any more questions? I think that's it then. Okay. Well, thank you so much yeah, for com you. coming in. Uh, those of you that decided to come in and those of us that are joining us live I think you said that we're gonna we're gonna we recorded this. So if you wanted to pass on the word and somebody missed it, they they all have an opportunity to to watch it again and it's pre-recorded. I think we're gonna have it on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for coming.